The year was 1841. On a small, French-owned island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, a 12-year-old slave named Edmund was tending to his master's farm. He was on plant duty. Some time ago, Edmund's master, Fechiel Bellier Beaumont, had taught him how to hand pollinate a watermelon plant. With this lesson in mind, Edmund tried his hand at a much more complicated plant, vanilla. For years, nobody had been able to figure out how to hand pollinate the vanilla flower. But on that day in 1841, an uneducated 12-year-old black slave tried once again. This is the light bulb moment, a Cheddar and Curiosity Stream original series. The oldest reports of vanilla being used in any form dates back to the Maya, a group of indigenous Colombians. But the Tutanacs, a tribe of indigenous Mexicans, are usually credited as the earliest growers and farmers of vanilla. They hailed vanilla as a holy plant, using it not for flavoring, but as a medicinal herb and as a natural perfume. It wasn't until the 1600s that apothecaries for Queen Elizabeth uh, discovered that vanilla could be used actually as a single ingredient. And that's when it really started to kind of explode then. Mexico remained the main exporter of vanilla products well into the 19th century because, mysteriously, no other country could find a way to cultivate vanilla beans. But in 1836, Charles Morin, a Belgian horticulturist, solved that mystery, pinning down the source of Mexico's monopoly. In Mexico, it would be pollinated by this bee called the melipona bee um, that would, was naturally attracted to the orchid and would go in and break that membrane and pollinate that orchid to produce the vanilla bean. So when they took it out of Mexico to other areas of the world, they were able to grow the vines and get the orchids, but they never got the vanilla beans themselves because they didn't realize and understand that there was this bee and there weren't other insects or, or birds or anything naturally attracted to the orchid in these other growing regions um, that would be able to go in and, and actually do that. And so vanilla remained a rare commodity. In 1841, on the island of Reunion, Edmund discovered that the male and female parts of the vanilla flower were, in fact, quite close together. However, they were separated by a flap, which kept the two from ever touching naturally. Edmund moved the flap out of the way with a stick and tapped the male and female parts together, dusting the plant with pollen. The first successful and replicable hand pollination of a vanilla plant. In 1841, Reunion exported approximately zero vanilla. Just seven years later, it was exporting 50 kilograms. Ten years after that, two tons. And by the turn of the century, Reunion was exporting 200 tons of vanilla. For his contribution, Bellier Beaumont set Edmund free. Demand for vanilla outpaced the speed at which the plant could be cultivated. So naturally, scientists decided to try to imitate the bean as best they could. German scientists Ferdinand Thiemann and Wilhelm Harman deduced the chemical structure for vanillin. They realized they could synthesize an artificial version of it using a chemical reaction. Vanillin was the first ever flavor compound that was separated from the ingredient itself. This was a seismic shift for food. Up until this point, artificial flavors had only been created by accident in labs. And those artificial flavors were wildly popular. People just couldn't get enough of sugary and artificially sweetened products. But while the public grew accustomed to the taste of the once uber-rare flavor, they were also being introduced to new artificial flavors. Chemist Vincenz Kletzinski developed this flavor chart in the 1800s, signifying how to mimic natural flavors with different synthetic ingredients. 
With the proper proportions of chemicals, one could create 15 artificial fruit flavorings. A little bit of diluted chloroform, a dash of nitrous ether, two parts of aldehyde, some acetic ether, 10 parts a mil valerlanic ether, a squeeze of oxalic acid, topped off with glycerin, and you have a deliciously synthetic apple taste. From the 1860s up until the early 1900s, artificial additives were everywhere and completely unregulated, especially in the US. Without regulation, food manufacturers got sloppy. According to the American Journal of Public Health, between 1887 and 1893, the bureau which would one day become the US Department of Agriculture did studies into what ingredients were used in common foods. They found that there were bleaching agents, chemicals, and dyes in molasses, chicory, acorns, and seeds in coffee, acids and metal salts in canned vegetables, and a long list of others. Some chemicals were added for preservation, others were added for flavoring, and others just seemed to have been recklessly tossed in. Public concern was growing, but there was a limited publicly available proof that these flavoring chemicals had negative effects. Between 1879 and 1906, over 100 bills had been introduced in Congress to regulate food and drugs. None resulted in sweeping legislation. So in 1902, Dr. Harvey Wiley and the U.S. Bureau of Chemistry decided to get involved. He created a focus group comprised of 12 young and eager clerks who would consume a spread of chemically adulterated food. He called this group the Poison Squad. These brave human lab rats feasted on borax-laced meat, formaldehyde milk, and canned peas spiked with salicylic acid and copper sulfate. The men were subsequently brought to their knees with stomach aches, digestive pains, and pounding headaches. Since then, the EU has banned borax for its effect on reproductive health. Formaldehyde has been found to cause cancer and is now used in construction glues and as the preservative of choice for morticians. Copper sulfate is a common pesticide. The sacrifices made by the Poison Squad, combined with the work of muckraking journalists and best-selling books like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, finally resulted in legislation. In 1906, the U.S. government passed the Pure Food and Drug Act. This far-reaching legislation enacted regulatory practices still adhered to today. It did not remove artificial flavors from products, but made it mandatory to list them in the ingredients and label them as artificial. Meaning, foods that had imitation ingredients could no longer lie and present themselves as real or natural. But now, instead of pretending to be real, chemists took pride in faking flavors. Japanese chemist Kikunai Ikeda concocted monsodium glutamate, a chemical compound he believed replicated the umami taste of a seaweed-based broth. We know this today as MSG. Then there's diacetyl. It was found that this chemical compound produced a buttery flavor. And so fake butter took the world by storm. That yellow liquid you pour over your popcorn at the movie theaters? Yeah, that's diacetyl. Artificial grape flavor was discovered, as the story goes, by a man on an Indianapolis streetcar who caught a whiff of a passing woman's perfume. What he smelled was methyl anthranolate. And all this time, vanillin continued to take the world by storm. Chemists found new ways to synthesize the flavor, trading in coniferin from the bark of pine trees for lignin, a byproduct of paper production. By the 1930s, artificial flavors had comfortably found their way into national and international diets. By the 1940s, during World War II, shortages of food and spices increased the demand for processed food production. Flavor additives were critical. They made processed food taste, well, real. 
But of course, increased usage means increased scrutiny. And in 1958, the U.S. government cracked down on food additives. The FDA expanded a previous law, requiring food manufacturers to do more than just express that they're using artificial ingredients. They now had to make sure that those ingredients were safe for consumption. To make this easier, they also created a list of 700 additives that were generally recognized as safe. These, of course, became some of the most used ingredients in food production. In 1976, however, when vanilla beans were reaching exorbitantly high prices, one company sought to change all that. McCormick used special technology like gas chromatography and mass spectrometry to create a superior synthetic vanilla with more flavor compounds than just vanillin. While a majority of consumers have become used to imitation vanillas, there has been a resurgence of demand for the real thing from those looking to avoid artificial ingredients. But that sort of demand isn't sustainable on a global scale. So companies have been putting a wealth of effort into synthesizing vanillin products from natural ingredients. These natural vanilla alternatives might become a more coveted product in the long term, as climate change threatens the landscape for not just vanilla, but other fickle crops that only grow in specific parts of the world. It's the same with, uh, with cocoa for chocolate. It's the same with coffee. You know, they're all grown in this kind of same band of the world, and they're all sub subject to these kind of environmental conditions. In 2017, a tropical cyclone destroyed roughly 30% of Madagascar's vanilla. And that one storm alone caused the prices of natural vanilla to spike so high, it was more expensive than silver. With all that said, it's clear that vanilla will always be in high demand. Whether or not plantations will be able to keep up with that demand is up for debate. But one thing that can be said with certainty is that credit for the vanilla industry as it stands today is entirely due to Edmund Albius, a young black man and former slave that the world owes a huge and flavorful debt of gratitude. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. You can watch full 22-minute episodes every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Cheddar's live network or anytime on CuriosityStream.